Here we are in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, Bar Harbour, Maine, on the edge of Acadian National Park. And today we've got a guest artist, Michael Karras of Maine, and Michael and I are going to look around and see if we can find somewhere fascinating to paint. Always a difficult job to search a place out, but it's always very, very interesting. Michael. Hello, John. How good to see you. Good to see you. What a terrific spot this is. Well, welcome to Maine. It's, uh, <laughs> what do you think of our glorious summer weather? I think it's just dynamite. Just dynamite. And what about this view? Do you see, I like this because there's no, it's unimpeded. You can see the whole thing from everywhere, can't you? It's just too complicated. It, it's, it's a, it would be very difficult because there's all the rigging in it and you'd have to be wet on wet all the time. There's a perspective problem here. It would be very difficult for the beginner and very difficult for me too. Uh, there's just too much there and the top light is another thing that's bad about it. If, if the sun was way over that hill looking this way, it might throw up silhouettes that would be more exciting. It's almost every direction there seems to be a painting, but look at this with that simple uh, dragger type fishing boat and the way that these rocks sort of lead your eye around. It does look like one of your paintings, Mike, <laughs> well, right there. Well, and the, uh, yeah. the shape of those islands in the background could be an interesting composition. And simple for the beginner. Very simple. One, uh, uh, yeah. That's very simple for the beginner. Yeah. I guess that's the type of thing they should... I think so. Again, we're a little bit in, uh, getting the high light in the middle of the day here. I think that would be uh, good to come around tomorrow morning or even later in the afternoon when uh, the light is low. But uh, just a, a painting could be something just as, as simple as that. Arcadia National Park is just an enormously diverse oh, beautiful. Uh, place, different subject matter. And uh, boy, this is really a spectacular view. That's this, is a, wonderful. this is a freshwater pond. And, I mean, to find this here is a, a treat. That's a jewel. It's a landscape, but it's a jewel it's right certain, in the middle of this park. It certainly is. It is quite a bit, a lot, a lot of green mm. right now. Um, you know, I suppose it has some consideration. And the, I think the boathouse there makes this scene. I believe that that boathouse and all of that land over there is, is still owned by the Rockefeller family, and I mm. think that they allow people to still walk mm. along there mm. and uh, spend day trips out there. No, this would have, that would make a nice painting right there. It would, it would. Those mountains are really dramatic. Now this, Bass Harbor, right? We've really come across a nice little part here. And these, these boats in the foreground are just sensational. Look at the top light on the seats and on the yeah. gunnels, just really beautiful designs. Yeah, yeah. The juxtaposition of those boats is really outstanding. And the simplicity of that. This, this perspective leading into the opposite really shore, nice. the building and the boats in this little group. Even those clouds fabulous. work really nicely. The clouds are fabulous, just as they are. And this is quite different from the other views that we've um, yeah. seen. It's yeah. A, yeah. more of a working man's yeah. harbor. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've seen a, a, a really good variety. Uh, what we've looked at right at the beginning was that rather complicated thing right in Bar Harbor. Sure. And then a less complicated thing we were looking at from a different light, the same scene from another angle. Uh, then we went to the cliffs, then down to the other little harbors, and all of them have their own little characteristics. That last one with the little uh, boats uh, right by the pier, I was very turned on to that. I think the main thing, the main with an E, thing <laughs> that's right is the one with the cliffs i think so that really says i think that bar harbor arcadia yeah, national yeah, park yeah i don't know if you've ever seen this easel here john let me before i put my canvas on there i made this all out of uh some parts from an old uh, surveyor's tripod oh, and I fashioned the rest that's of it. Terrific. It's fully adjustable. I can take up to 11 by 14. It sort of all folds up and I'm painting, I think I'll paint about a 10 by 12 that's today. It's, this is a and I love this bit here. Now you, you know this already, but I use five colors. You use more, don't you? You use 
quite a bigger. Well, I do have a, a little bit of a range. I basically use a full range pallet. Um, and I always squirt my pallet out in the same order. Never vary from that. I sort of equate this to, no matter, no matter what I'm painting, it's always the same amount of things. I equate it to a piano player, even though you might be playing a piece of music and not hit some particular keys. I want to have all of my keys in place. And I do it in the same order from warm, basically the uh, warm tones right down to cool tones. And not only do they go warm to cool, they also go more opaque to more transparent. Five colors out here in white. And I've always, uh, I was always influenced right from the beginning to use very few colors. And the thinking behind that is that there, there are going to be less jumping around in the spectrum. Basically, it is red, yellow, and blue. The only other two that I add are uh, the convenience colors of permanent green and burnt sienna. And this burnt sienna and French ultramarine make a black that's blacker than anything that, that is in front of us. It looks awfully black down there, but these two colors will make a stronger black than anything that's there. And so I, I like to make black because I want it to be either a cool black or a warm black, and I can get that off any of these colors here. And it's what you're brought up to use from early days probably, and then you add things and then you subtract them, and your palette changes as you go through your life as a painter, but I find that these have been sufficient for me and have been able to do all the things I want to do right here. Uh, so I've always stuck with my five colors and find it, um, I'm very happy with that. The first thing we both have to do is to decide exactly what we want on here, where Michael wants to have his and where I want to have mine. And so it's always going to end up smaller on here because we, this looks so big to us from here and we could do a big painting like this of it but we're doing a small painting because we can do that readily quickly fairly readily now the end headland there will have to be in it and some sea beyond that and then for me I want to have all this big block of rocks there in it so I'm now going to put on where I think my parameters are going to be with very thin paint so that it doesn't so that I can just take everything off again if I don't like it. Here we go. This is a trial balloon here. No. Trial balloon. So I'm going to come right down there. It's too there. And I'd like to have this rock right in the foreground, which is right there. Yes, I think it's going to work fine. And the edge of that will... Basically, the thing is to establish the horizon line, because you can't make those sort of changes after you've begun. I think that'll be terrific. So I'm going to start by laying in the sky and seeing how the whole thing looks. I, t I like to approach this kind of subject with uh, as little line drawing as possible and really try to block in whole masses. I'm doing that very thinly with some washes now. And I'm trying as quickly as possible uh, to establish my drawing and cover my white ground. Those wind patterns, it gets some interesting, right mm -hmm. now it's changed a little mm -hmm. and it'll mm -hmm. probably still change, but that interesting wind pattern has these different shades of blue and there's ways you can put little, extract little notes of purple or other thing that's complementary to the, to the rock colors. I'm just sketching in, this is what it really is, it's a sketch that's uh, then taken further and further and left hopefully before you ruin it. <laughs> You've got to try and get a 
expression, we're trying to express this and not uh, turn it into a Kodachrome. I want to establish some of my darkest darks. I generally paint from dark to light, get my darkest darks in first and hopefully they stay there right through the painting and paint some of the lights up to and over them. It's amazing, isn't it? This water looks blue, but there are all sorts of colors in it. And here we are, we can see this. If you took a camera shot of this, these colors wouldn't be apparent. We're looking and we can change the aperture of our eyes uh, and, the, and see those sensitive places there. Little bits of red in the, in the water yeah, it's there. Amazing how much, it's amazing how much red there is in the water, isn't it? Oh. It's sort of red and, and purplish tones. Mm -hmm. I almost mm. think in this situation, and we get in kind of a high light situation, you, you maybe you need to uh, exaggerate the values a little bit too, make them a little cooler as they yep. recede, a little warmer in exactly. the foreground, exactly. a, a little darker in the foreground, lighter in the, exactly, yeah. as it recedes. I try to be a bit more uh, inventive and not quite so literal in my paintings and try to make things even improve on nature, if, if you will. Uh, and try to make this larger than life two-dimensional surface have the illusion of the three-dimension reality there was a wonderful quote from this painter around the turn of the century Burge Harrison and he said don't take nature as stupidly as you find it which I think is really great and just sort of need to simplify <laughs> Rearrange if necessary. One of the nice things about a place like this, it's not developed, you know, it's just perfectly natural, probably the way that the uh, Native Americans, the beginning of, of time, of mankind, were, were here and just enjoyed it exactly the way that, that we are now. Isn't that so? You can make a, a few mistakes, and as long as you get the general effect, but rocks it still looks do fantastic. very much have an anatomy of their own. I mean, Absolutely, there are still, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. two sides and a top, and yeah. it's important to have yeah. some suggestion and delineation of of those elements. Right, but I'm concentrating on this uh, semi-distant 200-yard point there, and. Um, Finding that changing as I'm, as I'm doing it, it's changing and getting darker because the sun's moving off the lighter areas. I often go out and paint in the company of, of other artists. Yeah. Although I occasionally do it myself. You know, art can be a rather lonely profession, but it's a, it's a wonderful way to have a little camaraderie and share. Oh, wonderful ideas. Made my distant hill a little bit too green. I think I need to cool it down. Mm, that's exactly what I had to do. This seagull's getting more and more. It's a, really, it's a bold seagull. Isn't Very it? bold. I think the distant headland there for me was the, the crowning glory you get, of it. You get that and you can key the rest of your painting off of that. Yeah, I think it was the bit that I really that turned me on to it in the beginning. I'm now laying in some of my uh, little more accurate local colors and I'm trying to loosely mix on my canvas the warms and cools together and let the colors actually vibrate on the canvas. That's what creates the illusion of, of light. We get lessons from the old masters in that regard too. This business of splitting up colors Almost mixing the colors right on the canvas, That's, that can be done too. I think if you but can... the thing is not to mix them so that you can't see the elements of each color. I love to see the elements of each color, don't you, sometimes? Sure, it's, you, if can, you can just you can get mix on as loosely mixed as possible. Yeah. I think that can be a highly successful, 
I think you can raise the pain to it to another dimension. It has yeah. a, a life of its own. An overdose of white can often make a painting look so chalky, and I'm a firm believer in trying to use as pure mm -hmm. color as possible mm -hmm. and mix as little white as necessary to get that, that illusion. Try to get that brightness with the pure pigment rather than a lot of white. And sometimes it's just, it's just could be the tiniest, tiniest mixture that'll, that'll put mm -hmm. you over the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one thing that, that a lot of the old masters are, had a real good handle. I think it was almost common knowledge that is, is kind of lost today. The amount of the control of pigment and color. I had mentioned Frederick Waugh earlier, John. Yeah. And he had a, I mean, he did this subject just, just fantastic. I think he was a great painter. Yeah. He had this theory that it was very important, especially with sea-related subjects, to keep it fresh. And he felt that it was important, even if you made a mistake, to leave it alone for the sake of freshness. It's better to have something yeah. loose and fresh and slightly wrong than tight and worked over and perfectly correct. Yeah. And uh, I always have that tendency to want to fix it and want to fix it. And very, very rarely does that fixing, does it ever really get any truly better? You know, it may get a little more accurate, but the painting itself as a whole never really improves that much. How did you start right at the beginning, Michael? Were you, in, were you doing this when you were five or ten or You know, I was. I, was I, I never made a I, decision to become an artist. It just sort of happened. I was uh -huh. always the class artist in elementary school. And as I, yeah. my parents saw that I expressed that interest, they sent me to local art classes or at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and things like oh, that. Yeah. But, but well before high school, I was already painting and, and actually selling my work. I've been making a living since high school. Isn't that fabulous? I think that uh, parents of uh, kids who show an aptitude should encourage their kids all the time. I think the student has to learn to draw, and I don't see them getting the encouragement they should get. And this is why I felt that these programs were so important. For me, as an artist, I wanted to see if I could do just something, my own two cents to to get people drawing again and looking at things and appreciating nature and mingling with nature. Hmm. Now, let's see. These uh, greys in the foreground we've got on these rocks are very difficult to do in the sunshine, aren't they? You know, yeah, they're, they're they, incredibly, incredibly subtle, aren't they? The sun is on them. But they're gray, and to make gray look sunny, it's just almost impossible. A little There's the answer right there. It's there right is the answer. You. Just kind of figured out what it is. It's right in front of you. <laughs> what I try to do is I try to dissect what two colors, what warm and, and cool colors or complementary colors together make that gray, yeah. and generally paint the warm tone underneath let's say if you can sort of extract pink or yellowish pink out of that then I would put of the it's close to the exact same value as possible a coolish blue or a blue green in the shadow on right no right over that color and let the two of them mix loosely right over it and, and to give the illusion of gray but it's made up of definite colors I like to roll my brush around Constantly just trying to keep a loose mixture, roll it and flop it and break up my strokes, get edges. You know, I, I, we first come to the spot and you look at, oh, that's so easy to already. And the more you get involved with it, you find out just the more difficult it is. That, those things, even though there's a high contrast, it's still so subtle. There are such value, such subtle value changes and temperature change. A lot of it actually is more temperature than value, isn't it, John? Yeah, it's you completely get, changed since yeah. we arrived. I'm at the point now that I'm just, just 
laying in heavy paint, trying to simplify, trying to really get my values, uh, the, some of the final strokes on there that I won't touch anymore. Yeah. Here, here. Getting this temperature from a point where it's very warm, kind of yellowish, this, this sun-drenched pink granite that it goes back through the painting all the way to this cool blue back there, just a, a gradation to give the illusion of distance. Yes, I want to put some strength now in the foreground, which is very black. And I'll be down to the darkest dark. It's absolutely amazing how black those rocks are yeah. down in there. I'll be into the darkest dark any minute. And make it live, and see if I can make it live. This paint is going to take a while to dry, I think maybe I'll leave it up here with you, Michael, rather than take it back with me. You, you could leave it up with me forever. Uh, it's just some wonderful reflected light back there, right in here. I see some light bouncing around from that, those lit surfaces bouncing back into that dark shadow cliff. And it's a beautifully warm, orangey, leaning towards pinkish tones. I'm trying just to put a little bit of that back in there, mixed with that cool grays. I, I got a stroke right here that I'm, I'm quite happy with. I think that works very well. And I'm just sort of still correcting, defining, putting wet heavy paint into wet heavy paint, loosely mixed, trying to create a vibration, that, that shimmer of the light that we see out there. This is where we learn, us who do paintings other than this, because I do the narrative marine paintings, and those things, if I didn't do this, they'd be just all yeah. contrived, and now I've, I'm filled with this experience and know yeah. a heck of a lot more than you, before we came You learn here. from your own doing. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. we can just put major strokes on at this point and make it do what we want to do. I have my top right-hand corner that I'm going to be finalizing the trees, but I'm almost through with the major part of the uh, seaweed and everything. Really a question of just small corrections. It's a question to get a little smaller. Yeah. yeah. You get your big shapes, your big values, and try to arrive at a point where it's just not too overworked, which is probably the most difficult thing of all, isn't it? Michael, it's always difficult to know when to stop, isn't it? Boy, I think that's one of the hardest parts of the whole deal. Wasn't there, I don't know who it was that said it, but that saying that it takes two artists to paint a picture, one to paint it and the other to tell them to stop. <laughs> who makes these quotations? I, 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 I don't know that come. somewhere, but I'm uh, the foggiest idea. Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of truth to it, isn't there? Absolutely. Well, I'm getting to the point where I've carried this about as far as I can. I'm. Uh, I'm getting to the point where one more brush stroke might ruin this whole that's, thing. That's and I'm where feeling I'm pretty happy about this. It's a, it's a sketch. It's uh, an outdoor painting. It's got a bit of life. Uh, and we had a fabulous time doing it. It was. And we learned really quite enjoyable. a lot here doing it. it. certainly did. Michael, it's been a tremendous pleasure to have you here today. And it's always nice to be with you. But to paint along with you like this has been a terrific experience. And I know our viewers will have appreciated it as much as I have. Well, thank you so much, John. It's been a real treat for me to have you come up to my beautiful state here and this wonderful Acadia National Park. It's been terrific. And, and there's just one more thing you need to do before you go home. Yeah. You have to go to the summit of Cadillac Mountain to view the sunset. It's really an incredible thing. I think tonight with this clear sky is just going to be beautiful. I'll be there. Waiting for the sun to set here at the top of Cadillac Mountain, I look back on the last couple of days and think how wonderful the experiences are that we've had. And I hope it'll inspire you to get out and paint and, and maybe come up here and see this. This is a fabulous place. And uh, I hope we see you again on the next episode. Let John Stobart show you the basics of painting in simplifying outdoor painting. 
This instructional video, never before seen on television, is available for $29.45, including shipping and handling. To order with a credit card, call 1-800-839-1991 or send your check to CPTV Stobart, P.O. Box 82, Hopkinton, Massachusetts, 01748.